Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share our study on the agricultural insurance program. As Sheila has mentioned, um, the agri agricultural sector faces many risks, including um, typhoons, um, drought, uh, climate related, uh, climate change related uh, events. And so for this afternoon, uh, we'll be focusing on the risk faced by those in the agricultural um, sector. Next, um, what I will be what I will be presenting this afternoon is based on our discussion paper towards a more inclusive uh, previous slide, please. Um, more inclusive agricultural insurance program, which has been prepared um, in collaboration with Dr. Aubrey Tabuga, our research associate Nico Borromeo, and our research assistants Arkin and Arkin Arboneda and Carlos Caballero. Um, this work actually draws on um, previous work that we have done on the agricultural insurance program. If we can go to the next slide. Um, we have been working on the agricultural insurance program since 2015 and have produced um, several papers looking at um, the implement the design, the implementation, as well as the impacts of the agricultural insurance program. Um, next slide, please. So all of these papers can actually be found at the PIDS website. So, but what I'll be focusing on right now is our more recent paper on making the agricultural insurance program more inclusive. Next slide, please. Um, so for this afternoon, I'll present the motivation of the study, um, discuss the agricultural segments in the Philippines, um, describe the program being offered by PCIC, um, farmers awareness of agricultural insurance, and some updates that we recently got from PCIC and some summary and recommendations. Um, why did we look at this study? After having done about 10 studies on the agricultural insurance program, we thought that it would be good to um, revisit um, the program and see what has been done since 20, um, since we last did the study in 2015, 2017. Uh, we all know that agricultural insurance is used as a mechanism for managing risk, providing a safety net for agricultural producers. And so it, this is a very important tool for farmers. Um, but vital to the development or improvement of the agricultural insurance program design is um, a better understanding of the segments of the Philippine agriculture. If we wanted it to be more inclusive in coverage, we need to be able to understand which segments of the agricultural sector are already being reached by the program and which segments still have to be reached. And so this could have implications in terms of the possible priority areas in the expansion of the current agricultural insurance program. We also wanted to revisit improvements in the implementation to ensure greater coverage. Next, please. So let me turn to a discussion on the agricultural segments in the Philippines. Next, please. Um, at the macro level, what we're seeing is that there has been a continuous decline in the number of agricultural workers since 2011. I think with the um, transformation of the economy, we're seeing that the share of the agriculture sector the GDP has been going down. Um, in fact, um, I look at my numbers, the share of agricultural gross value added to GDP has declined from 15.2% in 2000 to 9.2% in 2019. And also the share of agricultural employment to total employment has actually declined from 37.1% in 2000 to 22.9% in 2019. And the chart before us shows um, the decline in the number of workers engaged in agriculture. If you can look at the yellow, yellow line, um, it shows that in 2011, the number of workers engaged in agriculture is about 12.267 million. And that has gone down to 9.998 million workers in 2018 and further to about 9.2 million workers in 2019. And this has been brought about, uh, the long-term decline could be attributed to um, economic factors such as the growth, uh, the transformation of the economy, shifting away from agriculture 
and going more into services and industry sector. Next. Um, in terms of agricultural products, um, we can look at the yellow, okay, uh, let me call it yellow, yellow line that would pertain to Palai. So increasing uh, a little bit over time, um, that's in terms of um, output, fiscal output. And in terms of uh, corn, you can follow the red line um, slightly below the line for um, Palai. Uh, also slightly increasing, but what is really uh, has been increasing significantly over time and uh, and that would be your high value uh, crops and that would be um, uh, shown by the brown brown line. And the regional top producers in 2018 for Palai would be Central Luzon, Cagayan Valley and Western Visayas and then for um, Corn would be Cagayan Valley, Northern Mindanao, and South Sargent. And for high value crops, it would be Western Visayas, Northern Mindanao, and um, cannot see my, uh, it would be Davao. Next, please. Um, let me describe briefly the RSBSA because this is actually a very important um, uh, part of this uh, agricultural uh, insurance program and how we could make it more inclusive. The largest known registry of agricultural producers in the Philippines is the R RSBSA, and that was done in 2012, um, initiated by uh, BBM um, and implemented by um, uh, then NSO. Um, with the participation of other government agencies as well. So this RSBSA is a database of information on farmers, laborers, and fisher folk na nationwide, excluding NCR and ARMM. And the RSBSA registered about 10 million agricultural producers, of which 8.9 million are engaged in farming as either farmers or laborers. The pie chart would indicate the different groups so you would have about 3.2, 3, 3.3 million who are farmers only, 3.3 uh, million who are farm laborers. Then you have about 893,000 who are fishermen, and you would have combinations of farmers and fishermen, farmers and farm laborers, and so forth. And all of them would constitute about 10 million agricultural producers. Next, please. Um, now, what you can see before you is the data coming from the census of agriculture 2012 and uh, from there we can see that uh, the farm la land holdings that are at most three hectares comprise about 88.9 percent of farm holdings and 48.4 percent of total farm area in the philippines uh, the census of agriculture is, uh, and fisheries is actually done by the philippine statistics authority and then you have the registry, the RSBSA, which I have described earlier, um, also done for the same year, primarily the same year. And um, what you see is that there is a disparity in terms of um, the total number of farms um, the, and the area as well. Uh, I think this is something that needs to be um, reconciled. Um, we have actually taken a closer look in our previous studies on the RSBSA, and we have noted some of the um, deficiencies, if I may call it that, of the RSBSA. Um, and, um, and we can see here the, the differences. Um, so for instance, and I'd like to share with you um, an earlier study we did on chronic and transient um, poverty. Um, again, we find that a large segment of the agricultural sector are either, are either chronic poor or transient poor. Um, <coughs> we can see that because of the shocks, there are considerable movements in and out of poverty among households engaged in agriculture. Um, if you look at the chart, the green, um, circles, okay, would indicate the proportion of households who are not income poor, meaning non-poor, and the red circles would indicate the proportion who are 
poor, income poor. So we were able to make use of a panel data, meaning uh, follow or track the same households over time using the family income and expenditure survey for 2003, 2006, and 2009. And what you see is that um, some poor, non-poor uh, became poor the next period or retained or remained non-poor. And then if you go to 2009, again, some of those who were, who remained non-poor still became, still remained non-poor in 2009. And that those are what we call the never poor. Um, so you have about 33% of those who were, um, of, of the agricultural uh, households who, who were never poor in the three periods. On the other hand, if you look at the bottom of the chart, um, you will find a group who we label as PPP, meaning they were consistently poor all throughout the three periods. And they constitute about one fourth of the total number of households, so 25.6%. So um, you have about 26% um, who are always poor in the three periods and about 41% who are sometimes poor in these three periods and only about 33% who are never poor. And, and we think that if you provide adequate safety nets to farmers, you can actually assist this farmer so that even when confronted with shocks, they can easily recover from the shocks and move out of poverty more quickly. So that's how important um, tools that can mitigate risk, such as agricultural insurance can be. Next, please. So uh, what would be the role of agricultural insurance? So if we look at this particular chart, what we find is that uh, you have these farm inputs and they're used to produce um, agricultural output that could, um, that would yield income to the farmers and that would have implications on whether they um, remain poor or move out of poverty. When you have natural calamities like typhoons, flood, floods and drought and other risks such as pests and diseases, that could impact on um, their output and consequently their income. And so agricultural insurance is a risk management tool that can actually mitigate this risk. And um, so even if a farmer experiences, um, for instance, uh, flooding, um, if a farmer is equipped with um, a tool such as agricultural insurance, then um, even if his harvest is devastated during a particular season, he's able to plant again the next season and recover more quickly from that shock. Next, please. So the benefits of crop insurance to farmers would be um, in terms of managing risk, providing farmers funds to cover production costs for the next season, helping farmers to finance household consumption after a shock so they can smooth out their consumption. And this is actually better than an agricultural guarantee fund where you're actually helping the more the lenders uh, rather than the farmer. Next, please. So agricultural insurance could be an effective risk management tool that can significantly reduce poverty among agricultural households. Next, please. So let me um, touch briefly about some of the important features of the um, agricultural insurance program that's being implemented by the Philippine Crop Insurance Corporation. Next, please. So the principal mandate of PCIC is to provide insurance protection to farmers against losses arising from natural calamities, plant diseases, and pest infestation of their crops and other agricultural assets. And in line with this, PCIC has seven major product lines, rice, corn, high-value crops, livestock, fisheries, including non-crop agricultural asset and credit and life term. Non-crop agricultural asset is really, uh, would cover, for instance, warehouses, uh, boats, irrigation facilities, and other farm equipment. And credit and life term would cover accident and life um, insurance. And um, primarily insurance coverage is based on the cost of production inputs, or if the farmer is self-financed, or amount of loan if the farmer is borrowing. So it's primarily a production cost insurance. Uh, although from time to time, PC PCIC can also allow uh, going beyond the production cost um, uh, 
and um, having an insurance cover higher than the production cost. Next, please. So um, just to give us an example uh, for uh, the period of cover for temporary crops when cropping season or from planting to harvesting, um, and for permanent crops, that would be one year. There could be different types of insurance cover, multi-risk cover, um, which would include natural disasters, selected major plant diseases, and pest inf infestations. And you would also have the natural disaster cover. And what I'm showing you here would just be some examples in terms of maximum cover ceilings for rice and corn insurance. So depending on the variety and whether it's irrigated uh, or for seed production and so forth, the maximum cover ceiling could be from um, 41,000 to 65,000. And then for corn, it's much higher, um, up to 76,000. Next, please. Um, for rice and corn insurance, premium rate is variable per region, season and risk classification. And premium rates are shared by the farmer, lending institution, borrowing, and the government. On the other hand, for other insurance lines, premium rates are borne solely by the farmer. So that's one distinction here. Um, and I think this reflects also the um, prioritization of um, the Department of Agriculture uh, that uh, we actually provide greater assistance to rice and corn farmers. So even in the case of insurance, um, the government pays for part of the um, premium for rice and corn farmers, but for other insurance lines, for, for instance, for high value crops, uh, the premium rates are borne solely by the farmer. Next, please. Uh, but in addition to the regular programs, PCIC also offers special programs wherein the insurance premium is fully subsidized. And this is something that has grown significantly um, in recent years. Um, using the registry system for basic sectors in agriculture, um, they have this program that provides coverage for farmers and fisher folk registered under the RSBSA. And um, we know that there are a lot and the government cannot cover all of them. And so PCIC prioritizes them based on their location and size of farm land holding. And so first priority would be those with 1.5 hectares and below. Second priority would be 1.5 to 2 hectares. And um, third priority would be 2 to 3 hectares. And fourth priority would be more with those with more than 3 hectares and a maximum of three hectares per farmer is entitled to full premium subsidy. Um, the amount of cover, or meaning the amount of benefits that they can get uh, varies. If it's a borrowing farmer, it would be the amount of loan subject to cover selling per hectare. And for the self-finance farmer, those who are not borrowing, the maximum cover is 20,000 per hectare. This is for the RSBSA special program. Next, please. So I think even from that, we can see that um, the maximum cover is way below the production cost. Um, in addition, um, there are also other programs under the Department of Agriculture, such as the Sikat Saka program, which targets rice farmers in 45 major rice producing provinces. Um, you also have the Weather Adverse Rice Areas Program, and here the amount of cover would be a maximum of 10,000 per hectare. Again, um, covering rice farmers. You have um, other programs such as the Program for Unified Lending in Agriculture. You have high yielding technology adaptation. Uh, you still have, and, and during the time of Yolanda, and uh, I think even up to um, now, you still have the Yolanda Rehabilitation and Recovery Program and the Survival Recovery Assistance Program. So some of these programs are actually um, loans um, where uh, crop insurance is actually a requirement for, um, for these loans. Next. Um, and also uh, you have the Agrarian Production Credit Program and Credit Assistance Program for Program Beneficiaries Development. So the main um, beneficiaries here are the ARBs or um, Agrarian Reform Beneficiaries. And again, the amount of cover would be uh, the amount of loan granted by the land bank. Next, please. So here we can see the number of insured farmers and fisher folk by insurance program. 
and we can see that the bulk of them are actually under the special program. So if you look at the 2019 data and the pattern is, is uh, basically the same for, for the other years, um, really the bulk of them uh, for 2019, you have 2.2 million out of the 3.0, uh, 3.1 million insured farmers and fisher for folk are under the special programs and only 854,000 are under the regular uh, programs, which means that for the special programs, the government is actually paying government or PCIC, national government or PCIC and other government agencies are paying for the, um, for the premium. Next, please. Um, because of uh, some difficulties or challenges faced by farmers in um, uh, getting their claims uh, when, they're, when they experience damages, the PCIC has piloted the index-based crop insurance um, since 2011. What this, uh, because right now the practice is if, if the farmer experienced some damages, there's an adjuster that visits the farm and assesses uh, the damage and the compensation that the farmer gets is actually based on the actual damage um, experienced by the farmer. With an index-based crop insurance, um, for instance, the weather index-based insurance, it's actually determined, the amount of compensation would be determined on some weather um, parameter, weather index, so for instance, the amount of rainfall that occurs in that particular area. So PCIC has been exerting efforts to address um, uh, challenges in the processing of claims, uh, making sure that they're um, uh, processed quickly. And so they have piloted this index-based crop insurance, but um, uh, I think up to this date, they're still not offering this on a regular basis, so it's still being piloted. And I think one of the major um, challenges here is really coming up with, um, for instance, for the weather index-based insurance, um, weather information that's really for that particular area. Uh, right now, um, PAGASA generates um, information for a bigger area. Um, and we know that because of the topography of the Philippines, um, the weather or the, for instance, the amount of rainfall um, in one barangay could be very different from the other barangays, even in the same municipality. So I think that's one of the challenges in implementing um, an index-based, a weather index-based insurance. So um, unless I'm mistaken, I think up to now, um, it's still being piloted, refining this particular um, index-based crop insurance scheme. Next, please. So what's the process of securing agricultural insurance? Um, right now, the farmer insures ensures his or her farm parcel. The, the farmer has to submit all the requirements for insurance application and pays the corresponding premium uh, amount. Here, I, I think PCIC has done a lot of efforts towards simplifying the requirements. And um, for those who are under the RSBSA program and other special programs, they don't need to pay the corresponding premium amount. And um, in, in some cases, in partnership with LGUs, it's the local government who pays for the insurance premium. The amount of insurance coverage is equivalent to its estimated farm production expenses, if self-finance, or amount of production loan, if borrowing. And then the farmer starts planting, and for instance, if a, farm, if a few days before harvest, a typhoon hits the area and damages the farmer's crops, the farmer actually claims for damages, and the farmer is indemnified by the PCIC which is equivalent to the full amount of his insurance cover. So for instance, I think this is one of the, the challenges I mentioned earlier. If for instance, the farm is completely damaged, um, even if uh, for instance, the cost of production is about 45,000 in the case of rice, if the insurance cover is only 20,000, because that is what is provided for instance, under our RSBSA program, the farmer only gets 20,000. That, that's the indemnity that the farmer will, will get. So this is where the amount of insurance cover is very important. If we want the farmers to be able to recover quickly, he needs to have enough funds to be able to cover the cost 
uh, the production cost for the next planting season. Next, please. So let me just provide some updates on the agriculture insurance program. Next, please. Um, so number of insured farms is significantly increasing. Um, 3.1 million policies issued in 2019. I, I would not say 3.1 million farmers uh, uh, were insured in 2019 because I, I think there are, it's possible that there could be some farmers who availed of more than one type of insurance. So for instance, a farmer who enrolled his parcel uh, for crop insurance might also have availed of term insurance. And so um, they could be, there could be some duplication in, in, in counting. And so I think it's more accurate to say the 3.1 million policies were issued in, in 2019. And what the chart shows would be um, those policies or um, that were insured given the different types of um, insurance lines of PCIC. And we can see here that again, RICE would have the biggest share. It's the com most commonly insured agricultural product, 34.4% in 2018 and 32.3% in 2019. And um, uh, HVCC is still far below um, that. And I think that's something that we might want to take a closer look at because um, that's where you have higher productivity. Um, that's where um, we find that farmers who are planting HBCC tend to be better off than those who are planting um, corn or, or rice. Also, we find that farmers enrolled under credit and term insurance comprise 26.9% of total insured in 2019. Um, remember, this term insurance is for accident and life, uh, life um, insurance, and that's the second, uh, no. yes. Okay, third, okay. Um, okay. I'm having difficulty with, with my colors, so um, bear with me. So um, the, but what we're finding is that in 2019, the term insurance comprised, farmers enrolled under credit and term insurance comprised about one fourth of the total insured in 2019. Next, please. So majority of the insured pro farmers are actually enrolled under the PCIC special program. So um, you have the regular, the three um, stack bars here re uh, relate to regular programs. That's the bottom and then the RSBSA special program. And the, the, the one on top would be the other special programs. So since 2016, more than 60% of all insured farmers are enrolled under the special programs of the PCIC meaning they are, their, sub, their premiums are subsidized. And in fact, in 2019, it constitutes about 80%. And farmers enrolled under the RSBSA program comprised 59.2% in 2018 and 52.1% in 2019 of the total number of insured. Next, please. Um, and then in terms of area also, um, we're finding that uh, it has been increasing. This is based on the PCIC um, report from almost 500,000 hectares insured in 2013. The coverage increased to 2.3 million hectares in 2019. And compared with the total farm area of the Philippines based on the RSBSA, which is 3.5 million hectares in 2012. Again, take note that this is much lower than the estimate of from the Census of Agriculture and Fisheries. Crop insurance is covering 75.4% of total farm area in the country. That's based on the data from PCIC. But I think um, Mr. Salting probably can, can clarify, but I think this could actually, there could actually be some duplication of the area because if a farmer, um, for instance, a rice farmer insures the same parcel for two planting seasons, um, the same parcel could be counted uh, twice. Um, next, please. The also in terms of um, the, the subsidy, the share of government premium subsidy has been significantly increasing. Um, farmer shares in the case of regular programs account for less than 10% of the collected collected premium. And the premium subsidy is coming from the General Appropriations Act, the Department of Agriculture and LGUs account for 3.5 billion pesos 
or 72.3% of total premium collected in 2018. What this means is that um, there has been an increase, but it's mainly because of the government uh, providing free insurance to, to the farmers. But we all know how important insurance is, and so this is something that um, farmers need to take into account when they um, do their farming. Uh, right now, it's not part of their production cost. They don't really incorporate that as part of their production cost, but um, this is something that we think uh, the free insurance um, program needs to be really targeted to the very poor or the small landholders, because we think that those who can afford should pay for the crop insurance. And if you really, the other implication is that if you really want to cover all of the small farmers, that has a big implication on the subsidies that would be coming from the national government or from the from the GAA, from the DA, and the LGUs. So that could have some sustainability, fiscal sustainability issue. Next. Um, sources of information on agri-insurance. Um, we, recent studies also show the role of local government unit agricultural technicians as one of the key sources of agricultural insurance information. And um, many farmers become aware of this insurance program only when they try to avail of credit services because the agri-insurance is part of the loan requirement. Um, also, we found that other farmers know of only of the agricultural insurance after experiencing a calamity. So for instance, uh, an FGD that we conducted in Cagayan showed that farmers learned about agricultural insurance after Typhoon Ong Pong, as other farmers in their community were able to file for insurance claims. And they said that had they, had they been informed about agricultural insurance, these farmers would be very much willing to be insured under the program. So, um, we know that PCIC has done a lot of effort since we first did our study in terms of disseminating um, the information about insurance to more farmers, but I think there are still some segments of the agricultural sector that needs to be reached by um, more information about the insurance program. Next, please. Um, in recent years, there's been an increase in the number of insured farmers, indicating increasing level of awareness among farmers. And the share of insured farmers and fisher folk to total farmers and fisher folk as listed in the RSBSA has also increased. So, for instance, the, penet the, the number of farmers and fisher folk insured as reported by PCIC has increased from 1.7 million in 2017 to um, over 3 million in 2019. And if we compute the penetration rate, which is just the number of um, farmers and fisher folk insured um, divided by the, um, the total number of farmers and fisher folk listed in RSBSA, um, we find an increasing penetration rate from 17.55% in 2017 to 31.64% in 2019. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, there could be some double counting if farmers actually register or enroll in more than one product line. And so uh, based on the data coming from the Governance Commission for GOCCs, um, they have some numbers on unique farmers and fisher folk insured, and that brought down, for instance, the number of unique farmers from 1.697 um, 577 in 2017 to 981, 745, so that the penetration rate uh, from 17.55% goes down to 10.15%. Um, the same for 2018, um, the number of unique farmers is reduced to 1.717 million from 2.267 million in 2018. Um, thereby reducing the penetration rate from 23% to 17.76%. But I think that we don't have yet the data for 2019, but I think the pattern is clear that it has been, the penetration rate is increasing over time, um, but there's still a lot of segments that need to be reached by the agri-insurance program. Next, please. Um, this is the uh, just a table I lifted from our earlier study because I also wanted to show that um, there are some disparities across 
product lines um, across uh, different types of farmers. So um, this is something that we computed uh, for our earlier study uh, in 2014. And what we did was we looked at the number of farmers who had who had insurance um, and divided it by the number of, for instance, rice farmers in our SBSA. And what we find the general pattern is that right, the penetration rate among rice farmers is, gen is generally higher. Um, so for instance, in 2014, it's about 15.82%, uh, almost twice that of corn. Corn is about 7.19%. And the penetration rate among HVCC high value commercial crops is 1.92 and 2.17% among livestock growers. Of course, this data is for 20, 2014, and I'm sure the numbers have gone up significantly. But I think you would still find the same disparity across different types of farmers, with um, rice and corn farmers having higher penetration rates than those farmers engaged in HVCC and livestock. So if you want the agriculture insurance program to be more inclusive. I think this is one of the areas that that needs to be examined more closely in terms of reaching out to those uh, farmers engaged in HVCC and, and livestock. Next, please. Um, and by region, um, again, uh, we were incorporating this table to show that there are disparities across region where some regions would have higher penetration rates and um, uh, something for um, PCIC to, to look at. I, I'm sure that the numbers have changed uh, over time. I'm sure the numbers have increased uh, because of the efforts that have been done. But the disparities across regions is something that, that could be examined more, more closely so that um, there could be more equitable um, access to insurance across the, the regions. Next, please. Um, and, and in line with this, to be able to um, expand and reach out to, to more uh, farmers and fisher folk, PCA, PCIC also extended its operations by adding more provincial extension offices and service desks. Since 2014, PCIC now has 13 regional offices, 58 provincial extension um, uh, offices, and 20 service desks nationwide. Um, PCIC workforce in its national and regional offices are continuously increasing to cope with the demand for agricultural insurance. I know that when we first did the study, there were very few um, uh, staff and they really had to work contend with a lot of farmers in each of the regional offices. And they were, I, I think the job orders were even, the number of job orders were even greater than the regular staff. Because if I remember correctly, I think each, uh, regional offices office only had about 14 less than 20 um, uh, permanent plantilla uh, positions next please so uh, PCIC has also been establishing partnership and linkages with LGUs and other institutions um, I, I think to be able to reach out to, to the farmers and um, I'd like to mention that um, in our previous study, we looked at the partnership with LGUs and one of the, the scheme or the modality was that LGU linked up with them and provided free or subsidized premium to some of the farmers in their locality. So that's one way that uh, more farmers were covered by LGU um, providing for the insurance premium for the farmers in their localities. Next, please. Um, I think uh, since our earlier study, we've also seen an increase in the insurance cover for rice and corn, um, just by the, this example here, because one of our earlier findings was that, and I think it's still uh, true for today, um, that the rice, that the insurance cover or the maximum benefit that you can get um, for the free insurance um, program is much less than the production cost. And so uh, farmers would not really have enough funds to cover the production cost for the next planting season in case their um, production is completely damaged. Um, the trade-off here is that uh, given the limited funds, the I think the question that 
that will be faced by by the implementing agency is do you want to cover more farmers do you want to insure more farmers um but that means providing them smaller insurance cover or do you want to provide adequate insurance cover but to do that you would have to insure less number of farmers so i think that's one of the dilemmas being faced by by PCIC, um, the trade-off between um, covering more farmers, but at a lower insurance cover versus um, covering less farmers, but providing adequate insurance cover. And I think if you really want uh, more adequate insurance cover, that means less uh, farmers that you can ensure, but if the targeting is done better, then you can ensure that um, the small, the poorest farmers can actually be the ones that can enjoy the benefits of this free insurance program. Next, please. Um, there have been, we've also noted uh, since our earlier study that there have been improvements in resolution of complaints, but there still need to improve claims processing. So for instance, we find that 90, more than 90% of total complaints received were resolved within 10 days, and about 70% of claims application were processed and settled within 20 days. Although we noted that the um, trend, um, or yeah, the pattern between 2017 and 2018 is that the percentage of claims processed within 20 days has actually uh, gone down. Um, and I, I think the, the challenge here is that, for instance, if there's a, a calamity that I, I remember, um, Haiyan, um, Typhoon Yolanda, where damage affected so many farmers in one area, it took, it really, it was really a, really a big challenge for PCIC, and it took a long time to have all of the claims processed. And um, so this is one thing that, that needs to be um, uh, looked at. Next. Um, targeting of beneficiaries for insurance subsidies. As we know, uh, especially right now, I think where the fiscal space um, might probably be limited because of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the targeting of beneficiaries is very important. Um, the RSBSA is used as the main targeting tool for the provision of free agricultural insurance coverage. Um, since 2016, almost 60% of the insured farmers were enrolled under the RSBSA special program. And although the RSBSA is the largest known registry of agricultural producers nationwide, there's a need to validate the database. Our earlier studies found that there are leakages, meaning there were non-agricultural non producers listed in the registry, and also exclusions, meaning legitimate agricultural producers were not listed in the in the registry. So if you're using this registry as the basis for um, government assistance programs, um, it's very important that this registry is updated and also validated. Yes, please. So in an effort to update the RSBSA, various line agencies submitted a list of farmers and other agricultural producers to the Department of Budget and Management. And so DAR submitted a list of about 1.9 million farmers and fisher folk. Uh, BIFAR submitted about 1.2 million, DA about 644,000, PCIC about 21,000, and NIA about 3,000. And this list were consolidated to form RSBSA version 1.1. Um, that's about... Um, all of this totaled about 3.85 million. And so you have the original list uh, from the RSBSA that was done in 2012, consisting of 9.67 million farmers and fisher folk. And then you have the additional 3.85 million um, from this version 1.1. And the, the Department of Agriculture is tasked to clean and consolidate the registry to account for name duplication in both versions of the RSBSA. Next, please. And um, what PCIC did was to combine and analyze the two versions of the RSBSA. And 
um, they adjusted the list to account for name duplication. So um, from the 13.5 million records in the combined versions of the RSPSA, uh, PCIC reduced the list to about 10.9 million. But um, we think that this is really more just adding, but we think that uh, some of the names still need to be dropped from the from the list and further validation still needs to, to be done. But I think what is nice to know here is that efforts were made um, to up to um, update and, and validate the registry. Next, please. So in terms of summary and recommendations, um, we find that increasing number, we find an increasing number of farmers with agri-insurance, but still low penetration rate especially if you look at the different types of uh, product lines and groups of segments of, of the agricultural sector. Uh, the insurance cover of the free insurance program is not enough to cover production costs. It's still um, mainly around 20,000 for, for rice farmers, um, much lower than the 45,000 production costs. Um, there have been improvements in resolution of complaints, but claim processing still need to be improved. There's been increasing level of awareness of the insurance program, but more farmers need to be reached. The RSBSA of 2012 and the expanded version needs to be validated and updated. And providing all farmers with free insurance would be costly. So alternative financing scheme needs to be tapped. And then in terms of more, next please, in terms of more specific recommendations, just the last slide. Um, as the main tool used for the provision of free agricultural insurance, I think the, the, um, Updating of the RSBSA is the should be the top priority. And with the passage of the CBMS Act, um, uh, this could be used to identify and geotag agricultural households in, in the country. The second is um, in terms of improving penetration rates and targeting of beneficiaries for free insurance. I think that PCIC can establish um, more partnerships with other institutions. Um, to reach out to more farmers so that um, the penetration rates, more farmers could be covered and the targeting could be more efficient. And finally, in terms of increasing insurance cover by partnering with LGUs and encouraging farmers to pay for insurance. I think that was one of our concern that with the free insurance program, um, the farmers could get used to not paying for crop insurance. And if this program um, does not get increase, increasing budget over time, um, what will happen to, um, to these farmers? So with that, uh, I'll end my presentation. Thank you.